just after lunch on the 5th of August 2010, a, a copper mine in San Jose, Chile, collapsed down in on itself. Uh, 33 miners were trapped 700 meters underground. You may well remember uh, the events. It was widely reported um, and followed in the media. In the coming hours, the world's media assembled right next to the mine as a rescue mission was launched. Three enormous drills were drilled down um, into the earth uh, to get to the miners stuck underneath. Uh, it took weeks and weeks and weeks until, to cut a long story short, 69 days later, one by one, all 33 of these trapped miners were rescued alive. Well, today we're thinking about a rescue. And it's a rescue on an even bigger scale to that Chilean mining rescue. We're going to be thinking about God's mission to rescue the world. And that's what, uh, really what these verses in John 3, 9 to 21 are really all about. God's mission to rescue the world. And I hope, that, I hope as, we, as we look at these verses and consider them, it uh, will not just be gripped by the most extraordinary rescue story ever, but also that we might be moved to respond rightly to it, that we might be those who believe and keep believing in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we too might be rescued. God's mission to rescue the world. And we're going to think about it like this. Firstly, we're going to think about the world and what John and what Jesus have to say to us about the world. Then we're going to be thinking about God, the rescuer. And then we're going to think about two possible responses to his rescue. God's mission to rescue the world. So if you've got your Bible there and you want to have it open in front of you, we're in John 3, 9 to 21. So firstly, I want us to think about the world, uh, the, the object of God's rescue mission. In verse 16, we're told, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Verse 17, God sent his son into the world. What does Jesus tell us about the world? Well, the world in John's gospel, it's not just a way of saying everyone everywhere. It actually means more than that. The world in John's gospel means everyone everywhere in rebellion against God. So, for example, in chapter 1, verse 10, we're told the world didn't recognize God. In 7, verse 7, that the world hates God. In 14, verse 17, the world doesn't know God. 16, verse 8, the world is in the wrong. So, world, according to Jesus and John's gospel, means everyone everywhere, but in opposition to God. Now, there's a film called Blood Diamond. Um, you may well have seen it. I haven't seen it in its entirety. I've just seen clips of it, but I know the full narrative of it. Um, it's set in Sierra Leone in 1999. It's a fictional story, but based on real polit political events at the time. It's a story of a man named Vandy. Um, he's taken from his family and made to be a slave to harvest diamonds. Uh, Anyway, when, as, after he's, he's taken away from his family, whilst he's gone, his son, Dia, is rounded up as a child soldier. And sadly, that was often the type of thing that happened back then. Anyway, his father yeah, looks and looks and eventually finds his son. But his son has been brainwashed uh, by those who captured him and doesn't recognize him as his father. He shouts at his dad, leave me alone. Get away from me. I don't know you. Enemy, enemy, I hit you. I hit you. Get away from me. Uh, later on in the story, the son, Dia, even takes his gun and points it at his loving dad, threatening to shoot him. Well, Jesus says that the world is like that son. That, that we are like that son. 
Okay, we haven't been taken against our will and forced to be a child soldier. We're not victims of brainwashing. But nevertheless, that, that picture of the son pointing the gun at his loving dad, Jesus says, that is the world. That is us. And you might think, well, look, how can that possibly be true? You know, yes, okay, I see how it's true of Hitler and Stalin and Putin. But my child's primary school teacher or my considerate neighbor or me, is that really true? But then, of course, we don't do what God wants us to. And we do what God doesn't want us to. And whilst we like God's gifts, we don't, by nature, want him telling us how to live. And in fact, in essence, we say, would you please, would you just leave us alone here? This is what Jesus means by the world. This is the world whom God sent his son to rescue. Uh, but what does the world need rescuing from? What do we need rescuing from? Those uh, miners stuck down the, down the mine in Chile, they need rescuing from the mine. They need rescuing from, from starvation and from death. What about the world? What about us? And of course, there are lots of serious problems in the world. Global warming, war, the threat posed by hostile nations, poverty, and really, the list could go on and on. There are plenty of significant problems in the world, big problems. But according to Jesus, the world is an even bigger problem than these. According to Jesus, we need saving from an even greater danger. Jesus says that the world is in danger of perishing. That's the language that Jesus uses in verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Jesus says that the world stands condemned already. That's the language he uses, the very language he uses in verse 17. In danger of perishing, stands condemned already. So you think of a condemned criminal on death row. All of the evidence concerning his crimes have been heard. All of the mitigating circumstances as well. The jury has delivered a guilty verdict, and the judge has delivered him over to death. And so there he is, sitting in his cell, awaiting his execution, counting down the days. That, Jesus says, is, is, is like the world. It stands condemned, Jesus says, for rejecting God, and is awaiting his judgment. Now, I just want to acknowledge that this is it's quite a stark, shocking thing to hear. And maybe you've never heard this before. Maybe you've, you're hearing it now and you're thinking, this just sounds absolutely bonkers. But can you see that this is what Jesus is saying? This is the language that Jesus is using. A world in danger of perishing, a world which stands condemned. That's what the world, that's what we, by extension, need rescuing from. So we've thought about the world, but then let's turn to think about God, the rescuer. Because the amazing thing we see here is that even as our world points its gun at God, even as the world sits in its prison cell awaiting its death sentence, God sends his son on a mission to save the world. Verse 17, amazing words. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. The world stood condemned already. But to save the world through him. God launched a mission to save the world. In that film that I mentioned, Blood Diamond, when that son points the gun at his loving dad, what does the dad do? give up on his son, turn his back and just leave? No. He stands and with arms wide open and tears running down his face, he pleads with his son and reminds his son of who he is and of how he loves him until finally the son puts down the gun and they're able to embrace 
Well, likewise, even as the world points its gun at God, God was launching a rescue mission to save it, a mission that would culminate in the death of his son, a mission to take the condemnation the world deserves, to set the world free from death row, and to give it eternal life. Why? In those TV interviews with uh, the Chilean rescuers after that rescue, that was a question that they got asked again and again. What, why did you rescue? Why did you give all of that time to rescue these men? And what motivated you? And some spoke of their sense of duty, others of their, uh, of their compassion for, their, for these families, others of a sense of solidarity with those who were trapped. What about God? If you were to ask God, why did you do this? Why did you, even as the world was hostile toward you, why did you launch the rescue mission? God would be able to answer in just one word. Love. Verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Love. Love. Is what, is what fueled God's rescue mission. Love is what moved God to send his son to die. Not because the world is lovely and lovable, and how could you not love the world? But in spite, as we've already seen, that's just not true. But because God himself is just full of love. It's just who he is. God's mission to rescue the world. But now we've got to think for just a few minutes about our response to God's rescue mission. Because we, as we go on in these verses, we see that, in fact, there are just two possible responses to God's rescue mission. Either to believe in his son and be rescued, or not to believe in his son and not be rescued. Those are the two possible responses. So just listen, let me just show you that from verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Two options. Same two options in different language later on. Verse 20, everyone who who does evil hates the light. 21, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So Jesus is very, very black and white about this, very binary. It's two options, and it's one or the other. We love to have lots of options. You know, I think it was last week I was speaking about the census in England and Wales. And, um, you know, in the census under religion, if you don't believe in Jesus, you've got plenty of options. You can tick um, atheist or agnostic, or you can tick Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist. You can tick undecided or other or not sure or so many options. But according to Jesus, in fact, there are really only two boxes. Either you believe in Jesus and are rescued, or you do not believe in Jesus and are not rescued. There's no third option. There's no blank box at the bottom for you to write in your own description, according to Jesus. Two options. So let's think about those two options. Firstly, let's think about unbelief. Why would anyone not believe? Why would anyone spurn God's rescue as it's been described? Well, there may be any number of presenting reasons, but Jesus says at heart, unbelief comes from a a love of the darkness. Again, that's quite stark things to hear, but that's what Jesus says here. Unbelief comes from a love for the darkness. So look at verse 19 and 20. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. In other words, Jesus says, some people choose not to believe and be saved because they love the darkness and hate the light. In that mining rescue, out of the 33 miners who were rescued, um, 32 of them, as they were trapped underground, 32 of them longed to see uh, the light of day. But there was one man who was 
kind of okay with it all, who's kind of okay being trapped in the darkness 700 meters underground. His name was Yoni Barrios. Why? Well, before getting trapped underground, he had been unfaithful to his wife. And on the surface, whilst they were stuck underneath the ground, his wife and his mistress were at loggerheads. He was quite happy underneath the ground. The bright light of rescue for him would also mean the bright light of exposure. He was fine with the darkness. And it's the same with unbelief. Why would someone choose not to be rescued? Jesus says, because for some it would mean coming into the light, which would mean coming clean and turning away from sin. It would mean exposure. And even if God would then cover up our shame. Maybe you feel similar to that. And yet even this man, Yoni Barrios, he wasn't exactly looking forward to coming into the light. It would be a painful exercise for him. But nevertheless, when he's offered a place on the escape hatch, he takes it. Of course he does. What else was he going to do? Stay in the darkness? Starve to death? No. No. Well, maybe for just a handful of folk uh, this morning, as you hear this and you, as you think on this, you know yourself that you, you don't yet believe in Jesus. Maybe it's all new to you. Maybe you've got hundreds of questions. Um, and, you know, we'd love to help you think through those uh, questions in the new year. We've got a, uh, we're going to be running a short course called Hope Explored, an opportunity to look into these things and explore it together. We'd encourage you to think about that. More details on that next week. But maybe this is not new. Maybe deep down you know that this is true. And if that's you, I'd I'd love to urge you to, to, to come into the light, to believe, and so to receive the rescue God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If that's you, Jesus is offering you rescue. Will you take it? But then just a few words about the second response, about belief. What about us who do believe? What does this teach us? Well, I guess we could talk um, and spend some time thinking about the importance of continuing to believe, uh, on not giving up believing, uh, not forfeiting our rescue, even though belief at, at points can be difficult. We could talk about how we can be really sure of God's love for us. You know, sometimes we can feel totally at sea, and we doubt God's love, and we look inside, and we are aware of our feelings, and we feel unlovely, and we doubt his love for us. And actually, this teaches us to look to the facts of history, to look to God's rescue mission when he launched out of love for you, to save you a mission that you may not perish but have eternal life. We could talk and explore that theme of God's love for us and being sure of it. But just as we finish, I want us to just focus for a minute or two on being thankful. For those of us who do believe and who are rescued and await rescue, I want, to think, I want us to think about being thankful. Those of us who believe, do we realize we've been rescued? Those of us who do believe, do we realize what we've been rescued from? From, from perishing and from condemnation. One writer puts it this way, only those who know that they stood at the mouth of hell will fully appreciate the rescue we have in Christ. Do we realize what we've been rescued from? For those of us who believe, do we realize what we've been rescued for, for eternal life, so that even now we might uh, live in the light? Do we realize the cost of God's rescue mission, that he gave his one and only son, culminating even in his death? These are all of the essential ingredients to help us grow in gratitude to God, our rescuer, for his rescue of us. On the 13th of October 2010, 
Um, those, those 33 miners were extracted from the mine and the rescue was finally complete. And the crowd cheered, as you can imagine, and clapped every time one of them came to the surface. And as they came up, you can watch footage of this, they, each of them, I guess, expressed their joy and their gratitude in different ways. Uh, some were exuberant and sang. Others were more reserved and were just glad and just embraced. Others just smiled. Some were open, some were private. But all of them were overcome with gratitude for their rescuers. Well, for us who believe, who've been rescued and who await God's rescue from perishing and from condemnation, let's be those who are marked by deep and sincere gratitude to God, our rescuer, and to Christ, his son. Let's pray.